Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here, and I just wanted to take a minute to thank all the amazing people that we've met so far that have put so much work into producing this incredible event. So uh, Matt and I are both really excited to be here. So Matt, uh, we're here to help the founders, investors, and operators in the audience learn a little bit more about your experience building Netlify, specifically in the context of a few things. Fundraising, picking the right business partners, and most importantly, maintaining healthy and productive relationships with that group of people. And uh, I think it's safe to say that you're uniquely equipped to opine on this, given the five financing events that have happened throughout the life of the company. I believe over $200 million raised. And you and Chris have really been doing this over the course of seven years. So I'm excited to kind of hear, hear your wisdom, and I think everyone else is too. Um, so before we, before we give Matt a chance to talk a little bit about Netlify, I just wanted to quickly see a show of hands. Like, how many people have used Netlify before? How many people are current users or familiar with the company? OK, that's good. So Matt, on that note, why don't you explain uh, a little bit about Netlify to those that haven't had that exposure? Yeah, so Netlify is a cloud platform that teams of web developers use to build, deploy, and operate uh, websites and web applications, and was built around the insight that there was a shift happening in the fundamental architecture of the web, where we were moving from monolithic web applications, where every website was like one big monolithic application with app servers and databases and templates all bundled together into a decoupled world where you decouple the web UI presentation layer from all the back-end business logic layer. And we saw an opportunity to really build an end-to-end -end platform around that web UI layer and make web teams way more productive. Great. Thanks, Matt. So I think it's fitting to start the conversation with what put the company in the news most recently, which is a $105 million Series D raised at a $2 billion post valuation. Congrats again on this, Matt. Thanks. So I think many in the audience may have experienced raising early stage financing, but few a late stage round like this. So where I'd like to start is let's talk a little bit about that experience, raising a late stage financing and how it differs from some of the earlier stage financings that I think many in the crowd have more familiarity with. Yeah, of course, like you go into a financing with a way more established company and with a way more established plan in the early stages of raising funding. It's very much about selling a, a, a potential version of the future where, where you can build something that will be worth a lot. And in the later stages of, of fundraising, it's obviously much more numbers driven and much more a game of building a model that, that shows financial outcomes uh, in in a realistic time frame right like yeah. so so obviously that's that's like a big shift that said there's still an important component to really explaining also like the the vision you're building towards and all the things that sits outside the numbers and outside the model and what impact you think you can actually have have on the world and what you think what you think can be inflection points beyond just extrapolating from where the company is now and, and where it would naturally progress over the next several years. Yeah. And on that note, is there a different set of criteria that you feel like you and Chris really optimized for when thinking about who the right partner was at this stage of the journey? Um, yeah, of course. I mean, I think earlier on, early on uh, the choice of investors is even more important to some degree than, than later on because like the early stage investors are coming in at a time where the company is still being formed and shaped from the from the ground up and you need people that that are really aligned very closely with you in the vision and in their and and can help you go through those formative stages of getting a company up and running where of course as you go to the later rounds, you start looking a little more just also in the, the VCs start looking a little more just as you as a, as a set of numbers and, and in reverse as a founder, you also start looking a little more at the VCs as, as, as a set of numbers. But that said, like, we were still fortunate to really find a, a, a partner in Bessemer that we also felt really aligned with and that came to us with, with their like, description of our market thesis and, and had really nailed like, what, what was our belief in the market. So I think across all the rounds, looking for alignment on what you think the future should look like is, is really important because otherwise you're going to be pushing each other in different directions along the way. Yeah. And then is there anything different that one should expect from this later stage set of investors in terms of the support and value add that they give to the company from your experience that the crowd can learn from? Yeah, again, I mean, early on, 
you rely more on the advice and the input on going through the formative stages. Later on, you might need more of just the operational machinery, like what can their fund actually do in terms of helping with pipeline and deal flow and uh, hiring executive candidates and uh, getting you in front of um, in, in front of your audience in different ways, right? Like, so it, it changes maybe a little bit from the advice you can get from the initial like partners you partner with when you're starting to 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 launch that journey of building a building a company to evaluating more what the organization can do for you so it wasn't always this obvious <laughs> and i'd like to go back to the times when it wasn't and um just thinking about the first time you had to raise money what did it take to get people to buy in to believe in what you were doing at that time yeah, the first fundraise for us was, for, was the hardest fundraise we've had. Every fundraise since then has been a, a, a lot easier than that first one where, you, where, where we were two people uh, with the first version of, of a product and some real traction, some, some, early, some very, very early revenue numbers and so on, right? Like, and had to get people to believe that we had sort of had an insight that, that the architecture of the web was fundamentally going to shift over the next five, ten years. Um, and getting people to believe that, that that was like a real lasting phenomenon, that that was an architectural pattern and not just a few teams here and there building things in a different way, and that our initial MVP was not just like a simple solution for static websites, but the beginnings of a, of a really big cloud platform. That, that was like the, 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 way, the, the fundraise where we had to spend the most time on really explaining the, the core vision and selling people on, on, on a future that really didn't exist yet when we, when, when we set out to, to, to build Netlify. And then, of course, as each round has progressed, like that, that shift in architecture has just been starting to play out m more and more clearly in a way where where now people come to us because they're seeing it happening and, and, and that's of course a very different process. Yeah, and it definitely started to become more obvious shortly thereafter and the term gradually, suddenly certainly comes to mind, yeah. um, including to my partners and I. Yeah. And where I want to go next is, first of all, I should say that my partners and I have these fond memories of building our first Jamstack website and chasing he and his co-founder Chris to New York in an effort to earn the right to work with them around the Series B. And of course, the company's come a long way since then, but I want to talk a little bit about the macro climate and what that means for founders when it comes to choosing investors and raising money today. It's different. Yeah. So some would say it's become very fast-paced, very transactional. And if you think about the financing climate in that context, um, the notion of expecting investors to add any value at all, I think, has come into question, rightfully so. And I want to get your honest take on this. Um, yeah, so I've, I've heard a lot of different takes on that over, over time for, from like the only thing you should look for in an investor is someone that, that won't fuck up your company <laughs> to, to um, really looking for, for value adding investors. I've always believed that one of the most important things of building a, a, a business or a company is the people you surround yourself with and the people you get on board along the way. and, and and that goes very much for the for the people that come along to be board members and co-partners in the journey. And I think, regardless of the of the fundraising climate, I think everyone should always optimize for having people they feel are valued as people to have around them uh, along the journey. And then I would also say that, like, I mean, just just from 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 Kleiner Perkins and from you, right? Like, we we have now like probably. Over the, over the course of Netlify, three different executives we've hired because of, of, of intros from, from your network, right? Like that's a high impact to, to a company. Um, an investor like Andreessen can, has a, have a huge operational machine for back channeling on hires, for helping out with, uh, with go-to-market, with um, getting in front of customers and, uh, and just general a brand that can help your company uh, hire and, uh, and, and get in front of your audience. So for us, a lot of our investors have been really high impact and, and have really contributed value along the, the journey. Um, so, so I would always optimize for, for that. 
And if you were to go back to the beginning of the journey, knowing what you know now about how to have that productive relationship and get the most yeah. value from these investors for the company's benefit, what would you tell yourself when you were just getting started that you didn't know then? Uh, I mean, I would like I would tell myself a lot of things around like uh, understanding fund mechanics and uh, and uh, investor motivations when you when you start out. Uh, I would tell myself that I should uh, be better at sending up uh, sending out investor updates than I have traditionally been. <laughs> since They've gotten much better over time. It, it's that. improved, but uh, <coughs> but but it's taken a while. <laughs> so I think many in the room here will agree that talent has really replaced capital as the scarcest resource that founders are faced with today. And this is certainly reflected in the conversations you and I have on a weekly basis about hiring, recruiting, and sometimes even aqua hires. So talk a little bit about what Netlify is doing that might be considered unique to overcome the obvious challenge of talent being so scarce. Yeah, I don't know how many things we're doing that I, is like totally unique, right? But I think there's a set of components that I believe are really important for our ability to, to hire in this space. Um, the, the first is a little the same as when you go out and, and, and fight seed stage investors, that you have to have some kind of like broader vision of how the world could look like and, and what your company can do to, to get it there. And that also goes for hiring great employees, right? Like you have to give them some other reason to join your company than, than, than just a, a, a career and a job, right? And that, that has to be based on having some vision of how the world could be, be, be a better place. And for us, it ties into how the web can be better and, and seeing the web as a really fundamental open building block of, of, of information and, uh, and communication and interaction online that we want to, to further and strengthen. So constantly telling that story and building a broader story is really important to, to be able to attract the, the, the right people, even the right people you want to join your company, right? Um, another part is a real focus on, on building a, a company and not just a product, right? Like, um, and, and that means building a, a culture that people want to come and work in and want to be a part of. So we've tried to also really be intentional of how do we create a culture. And then there's been some specific components, like even early on, we, we, we were firm believers that remote work what was going to be a core part of like how the, how the world would end up working. That got accelerated a lot during, during COVID, right? But already before, uh, the pandemic, we had about 60% of, of, of our team working remotely and everybody working only three days a week from the office. Um, and of course, that's also to create a much bigger pool to, to hire from and to be able to go where, where the best talent is instead of requiring them to, to, to come to you. Um, and then another component that, that I think has helped us have been really early on trying to build a diverse culture. Um, like it, it would have been easy to just hire people just from our network and people that were very similar to us and that would like work well for the first group of employees but then we would quickly tap out our network right and instead right from the beginning we really tried building a, a, a pretty diverse company and by now we're like for example 40% women and, and, and non-binary across all parts of Netlify also engineering um, and I see that as a way of long-term expanding the pool of people you could access to, right? Like the, the, the broader the base of people you can get to come join your company, the broader the base of people you have to actually go hire from. So that's been one of the elements that I think has also been really important to us and that's a self-reinforcing effect. And we talked a little bit about this um, earlier in the conversation, but if I'm a founder or I'm a member of a startup, what can I do to leverage my investor base to maximize my success on the recruiting front? I mean, the first, the first thing is to really look for people you want to work with and you want to partner with and you feel that you, you, that you feel that you can build a really healthy working relationship with that's aimed at solving problems for the, for the company. Um, and then find a complementary set of, of investors, right? Like the, the, the group of investors we've brought on board gives us very different things, right? Like Kleiner Perkins has very much been the, the personal networks uh, are, and, and connections, and Dreesen has very much been the, the big brand, the operational machine. EQT has uh, 
been great partners to to work with, and we think BVP can add another another layer to that, right? Like, so I think also thinking about how you construct, like, if you have the opportunity, and we've been fortunate to have the opportunity of of doing, like, sub, of being fairly selective on on our end, right? Like, then I think putting together um, people with different skill sets to help you in different aspects of building your company is, is really valuable. So where I want to go next is the movement and the ecosystem that I think underlies Netlify. And I'd be lying if I said I don't think it underlies just about every great company I've seen. There is some kind of a movement that underlies it. So where I want to go next is uh, talk a little bit more about what this community that fuels the growth of Netlify and, and the movement that I think this, that unites this community means and, uh, and how you see that playing out going forward. Yeah, for us, like, we, we really pioneered this idea of, an, of a shift in the architecture of the web and a new Jamstack architecture that would change how developers build and, and operate websites and web applications. And, and I've, only, I've, I've often had seed stage founders, the Series A founders that seen what we've done with Jamstack come to me and say like, hey, how do I build my own category? Like, I want to make a category as well. And, and we are always first recommending like you, you really shouldn't do it unless you absolutely have to, right? Like it's much, much easier if you can ride a wave that's already there and just build a movement around your own company and your own brand than having to go and, and essentially put a, a, a brand into the world that's not yours, that you have to grow and nurture at the same time as building your own company. But that was what we had to do just because like when we started out, there wasn't even a name for this architectural shift. There wasn't a common nomenclature around it. And, and we, knew that, we knew that this shift in architecture was also a shift from a world where each of these different solutions were monolithic solutions like experience management systems with everything bundled inside or e-commerce platforms with everything bundled inside and to a world where you would have like a web UI layer and then all these different APIs, services, frameworks, tool set, tackling all the different verticals. So we knew that for Netlify to be successful, we had to be part of a really well-functioning, broader ecosystem. Um, so for us, it made a lot of sense to really nurture that from the beginning and really intentionally try to build an ecosystem that was bigger than our company and to build the Jamstack movement in a way that it was obviously not like just a Netlify thing, but a very shared thing. We spent a lot of time initially like reaching out to founders of companies nascent in the space, so larger companies that had a role to play in the space and really get them to see the value of, of, of participating in, in the category and talking about this in the same way as us and building alignment. And that has now sort of really created a groundswell where it's very obvious that there is a whole ecosystem and a whole movement and, um, and, and a movement that's only going to accelerate. And now we can sort of take, take our journey on, on, the, on that wave, but it would have been much, much easier if there had already been a, a, a wave we could have jumped on rather than having to go architect that whole thing ourselves. Well, I can, I can uh, assure you that many startups will benefit from your efforts in that regard, and I'm seeing that every day in my day to day. Great to you. Uh, so in the end, the people like me that you partner with are these people that you're going to be surrounded by for a decade or more, right? It's been seven years and, and counting. So what are some of the key attributes that one should aspire to as a founder when building that relationship? And then I'd love to also hear from you on like the tactics of maintaining that relationship, best practices yeah. from communication yeah. to anything, anything of that sort. I mean, first I think it's just like to be really high integrity and uh, build trust over time by, by honesty and as much direct communication as, as, as possible. Then the other thing sort of from the tactics perspective is that I think it's extremely important, all, like this is basically an all work relationship to separate the person from their job, right? Like, and remember that no matter who no matter who the person is that, that, that sits on your board, they are also someone that has a job from a fund to like, carry out a certain, certain role. And you should respect that position and that fact that, they, that, they are, that they're not just a, a, a person or an advisor to you or something. They, they are like, hired by a VC firm to create a return of investment to their LPs. Um, and, and, 
at some times that might, might align perfectly with your interest as a founder or in, and, and at other times it might not, right? Like, and you should be able to separate those kind of conflicts from, from the personal relationship to the, to the people you're working with. Um, I think that's an important part in, in, in building these relations and building respect long term that, that, that you understand when there's like moments where there might be some more pushing and pulling and so on, where that comes from and, and what role people are, are playing. Um, and then try to maintain like the, the, the trust and integrity at the, in, the, in the direct person-to-person -person relationship. That was a very honest answer, and I appreciate that. So I think we have time for one question, and it's the question I've been most excited to ask you, which is, what does the future hold for Netlify? What should everyone in the audience expect from the company in the future and, uh, and be excited about? And how can they get involved? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, we, we see this fundamental shift in, in, in how the web is being built as just getting started, right? Like, and we are still very much in the early days of it and have a lot ahead of us to, to build a web that will keep being the best platform for developers to, to deliver both applications and, and content on. Um, we sit like in, at, as a part of a very broad Jamstack ecosystem. And for us, the most important thing we can do is really to unite that ecosystem to create the best developer experience for people building for the modern web. And some, one, one of the things that, that we are really starting to working on is like, once you've accepted this shift from building everything with one like sort of package to a world where you have a web UI layer where you build the user experience and, uh, and, and try to differentiate yourself, but then you have all these different components from frameworks and APIs and services, and maybe every project you build are now composed of many different APIs and services. How can we, how can we help create some order out of, that, out of that chaos, right? Like if we think of all of these different services as, as Legos that developers now have available and can put together, that, that only really becomes fun if all the Legos have the same connectors and, uh, and, and not so much if you have to glue them together and, and uh, manually for, for each piece, right? So we are thinking a lot about like how can we find the right uh, connecting points to make it much easier for developers to, to maintain a coherent view of that ecosystem, to work with many different services. And we're also thinking a lot about like how can we invest back in that ecosystem and help it grow up and help it mature. So with our latest round, we, we, set, our, we set aside our own uh, investment fund, the Netlify Jamstack Innovation Fund, where, where we are investing, uh, we are, our goal is to invest uh, $10 million into a lot of different companies, um, small, small check sizes, but mainly to help seed stage companies in this uh, modern web space um, go through some of the same steps of, of the journey that we've gone through. We hope that we can help them both with uh, our experience and with our network of, uh, of advisors and executives. Um, and we also set aside a million dollars to invest in the open source ecosystem that surrounds that are often not like projects that are monetizable in, in terms of, of a venture-backed company, but that are often incredibly valuable to our customers and to the whole ecosystem, and we want to make sure we can help that part of the ecosystem grow up. So, of course, if you're here and, and, and you're building a seed state startup in the, in the developer tool space, API space, um, the space that just aims at making it better to build for the web, then, then do come talk to me. I think we are just on time. And uh, Matt, I want to thank you for being here. And uh, hope folks enjoyed this. And look forward to meeting as many of you as we can throughout the day. Thank you. Thank you.